Hi, it's Rob. And I'm answering your money questions. It's money book launch week. There's money book launch. Oh, I haven't got any money in my pocket. I'm skint. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I'm answering your questions about money. I'm gonna, this is my third video of the day. I'm going to be answering any question you've got. There's a thread running in the Progressive Property Community. If you want to put your questions there, I've got a load on the screen. I'll take yours live as well. So here we go. Let's talk money. OK, so Lucy Van Hilton has asked me, what do you think is the best investment strategy today and the best way to adjust as the world changes? For example, as blockchain and cryptocurrencies get stronger and plateau in five years and are replaced by the next big investment opportunity, how do you keep track of that and make the most of it? Okay, so um, I wrote a section, a chapter in the, in the new book Money about the history of money and it was a really deep research subject. Coined by Kabir Sagal was great. There was other great history money books and, that I read and I interviewed and um, people had uh, written the books. And um, what I realised in researching the history of money for, th for the thousands of years is that money's always changing form. Now, when we initially look at what's happening, for example, with Brit Bit Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, we're like, whoa, whoa, you know, the world's changing really fast. And, um, but actually, um, this has been happening all the time. So um, I don't know if Bitcoin will take off as a, uh, a currency or all the other, you know, um, Ethereum and the other cryptocurrencies, they're certainly looking like they could either be the next big currency or the next big Na Nasdaq, um, you know, volatile crash. So uh, I think the jury's out. I, my advice on blockchain and cryptocurrency, and when I say advice, it's not financial advice, got a disclaimer. Um, but generally what I would say is learn it first. Learn, learn, learn. Because, you know, you can mine your own Bitcoin, you can go through a broker or you can even just invest in a fund that invests in Bitcoin. That's three different ways of getting your money into Bitcoin. Um, you know, if you if you don't learn about it, then it's a gamble. And if you accept that it's a gamble and you're putting money in that you can afford to lose and you've almost written off, well, then that's OK because, you know, you're testing a new investment platform. Um, but, you know, just because it's high price at the moment, it's been going up and up, it's been going up like that, vol volatility, but it's been going up and up and up, um, that, you know, doesn't mean that now is the right time to get in. In fact, now could be a bad time to get in because there could be some big drop. Um, I think that the, um, the, the various cryptocurrencies, you know, they certainly look volatile and you don't necessarily know if any of them are going to be secure enough, are going to take off enough, are going to be scalable, are going to be ubiquitous. But the technology behind it, blockchain, does look interesting because it looks like it has many other functions. But something that intrigues me about Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies is the decentralization I think we have of money right now. Um, because, you know, individually, um, a thousand years ago, you know, we had little tribes, didn't we? And so money was pretty decentralized. There wasn't one World Bank and Central Bank. There was a tribe of 70 or 100 or 200 people. And we exchanged animals and grains and, you know, items between us. And it was very decentralized, loads of small economies. And then you had the big banks. And of course, they controlled them to a certain degree, monopolized a lot of the money or the money, the, you know, the fiscal policy. Uh, but now it's changing again because individuals can set up their own currencies. I mean, the artist I studied in this book, she um, created a, a cryptocurrency called Bitcoin, which was quite a good take. Uh, and, you, and you could buy a currency in um, her um, art in, you know, in, in her cryptocurrency. And there's just recently been a house that's gone on the market for something like 15 million. You can only pay in Bitcoin. So we've got like this decentralization in many ways. Um, of money and what that great gives is great opportunity for the entrepreneur to set up their own currency. I mean, look at the Bank of Dave. Dave, Dave, well, my name's Dave and here we go, there's a bank. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that what we're finding is that the big corporations are slightly breaking up and have less control. And so what that means is startups and entrepreneurs and individuals who are maybe disruptive and looking to sort of um, create better value and be more lean and more um, dynamic, you know, you can get ahead. So, I know it's a long way of answering Lucy's question, but which was quite open. So basically, the best investment strategy of today isn't necessarily a vehicle. It's the one you know the most about. 
So, you know, I personally with Mark know the most about property. I'm, I've got a, a passion for watches and so I've done well on it all by one of my watches, but I've got a real passion for it. I learn it, I read it, I study it, I track the prices. I'm interested in, you know, measuring the prices. I have a passion to wear them. Um, so it doesn't really seem like work for me to research them. I'm not a great researcher, but I don't really see it as research learning about watches. Um, whereas many of you are probably into Bitcoin already. I've got um, a good friend and a JV partner who's who's in, you know, seven figures, big seven figures. I mean, I don't know exactly what, but I know he's made a lot out of um, Bitcoin. But he was telling me years and years and years to go to get into Bitcoin. Um, and I probably should have done. But, you know, I, I, I guess the self-awareness I had um, took me years to get some self-awareness um, is that, you know, I know my limitations. Know what you know and know what you don't. Uh, and I know that I don't know enough about bit, uh, Bitcoin. You know, many of you might be great at information marketing or great at e-commerce or, you know, whatever. So really, there's not a best investment strategy. The best investment strategy is to build knowledge on a chosen investing strategy and focus and get really good at it and then diversify into your 70, 20, 10. Um, yeah, and then the next big opportunity, investment opportunity, opportunity in 10 years time, I don't know. You know, I don't have a crystal ball. I never pretend to. I'm no guru. I'm a student. So who knows? Um, but what I know is this, money is very liquid. Money moves, it changes form. It's, you know, in, in prisons, it's been cigarettes, it's been um, fish, you know, like um, it's been salt in the past. It's been stones that are, that are um, so huge that they've gone to the bottom of the ocean and they've just stayed there. Um, it's, it's always, you know, money has changed form. It's been in the, in the form of, you know, your, your meat and your animals. Capital uh, is under the head of a cow, the, the, the Latin or origination of that. And the uh, Latin origin of currency is flow. So money is very liquid. It's like water. It moves all the time. Now, what's happening with the speed of light through fiber optics and then even um, quantum entanglement, which might even be faster than the speed of light. What we're seeing is that everything is speeding up. Social media is speeding up access into connectivity across the world is speeding up, you know, we're bang, you're, you know, a second and this is live feeding to the, and podcasting to the other side of the world. So money is speeding up too and money loves speed. Money loves speed, money hates friction. It, its function is to flow, that's how it lives, that's how it's alive, exchanging um, value and energy between individuals and um, measuring, you know, unit of count and a, a unit of account and a measure of worth. Um, so in 10 years, I predict it's going to get faster and faster and faster and faster and faster because you know, we see, we see that the internet is very mature, but it's not. It's what was it, in the 80s. So there's still so much leverage of the internet, of social media, of these huge network online. You know, like Uber has no cars and Airbnb has no hotels. And, you know, I've, um, like all these huge networked companies with billions of users, but they don't own all this physical stock. Like a lot of the old companies, you Netflix, you know, they don't own any. You remember Blockbuster had to actually physically have all the... The, the tapes, do you remember tapes? I used to get well on Schwarzenegger's um, movies on tape when I was, was not 18. My mum used to tape me when I was 14. I loved Arnie films. Um, all right, so next question is from Stacey Watling. But if you want to post any in while you're live, or if it's not live anymore, but you're watching this, post them in and I'll catch them in another video. How do you catch, calculate your time, knowledge, worth, and how much to charge your clients when you feel they are not overly rich but need to support, but need the support and your service? Well, OK, so how do you calculate your time, knowledge and worth? You work out your income generating value, which is in, actually in Life Leverage. It's, not, it's also in this book, um, but it was I originally shared it with you in Life Leverage, where it is the number of hours. Sorry, the number you earn, no, the amount of money you earn divided by the number of hours. If you earn three thousand pounds and you work 30 hours, it's one hundred pounds per hour of exchange time for work. So you work out overtime and all the hours you work and then all the money you have from all sources, passive and active. And you have a figure, it might be £10 an hour, £50 an hour, £100 an hour, £10,000 an hour. And that is your value of time. Now, why is that a useful metric for you to have? Because you now know um, what you should be doing from an income generating time or an IGT perspective. And if it can cost you less to outsource it, you should be outsourcing it. Otherwise, you'll drop your hourly rate. If it could make you more, you can or should do it yourself because it could increase your hourly rate. So it, it will happen in a sort of a binary fashion that you'll choose. OK, well, because I'm worth £20 an hour and that can cost me £10 an hour to an outsourcer, then I should, um, if, if, if I actually do that £10 an hour task when I'm worth £20 an hour, then um, I'm lo essentially losing £10 in my overall time and value exchange. So it helps you outsource. It helps you 
and get your head around paying for help, for consultants, for staff, for systems, for software, which in your mind you perceive have a cost, but actually they have a cost for you not to invest in them because it costs your time more and your time is worth more. Now, of course, the given there is you have to reinvest that time that you free into income generating tasks and key result areas. So that's how you calculate your time, knowledge and worth. Um, and how do you know how much to charge your clients? Well, um, you, um, Stacey has said here, she feels they're not overly rich, but one, you don't know how rich they are. Never make that assumption. Have they shown you the bank accounts? Probably not, so you're making an assumption. Number two, you're probably judging them and never, you know, never judge anybody because you'll be surprised all the time. Um, number three is, you know, people will invest money on what's important to them. So if making money and learning and investing and growing and including, in, increasing your mindset is important to you, you will invest £10 in this book money. It's £10, it's not a lot of money. But if, you know, if, if someone has a bad relationship with money or they're not, they're not bothered about increasing their knowledge and education, net worth, then they'll spend ten pound of a fast food joint or whatever. So, you you know you people who you might perceive might not have a lot of money. They will spend their money on their highest values. So you know I know a lot of people, um, ex girlfriends for example, who ne didn't have necessarily have a lot of money, but they're spending hundreds of hundreds of pounds a month on the cosmetics and the makeup and everything else. You know, and it's like by the way, I never said anything about that because I valued my testicles. <laughs> so, but you know, there's you know, I used to spend thousands of pounds a year on designer clothes, even though I didn't have the money, and probably spent 120 percent of what I, what I earned because I was you know trying to make myself feel better about myself. So anything that you value is important to you. Your kids, you'll spend tens of thousands of pounds on your kids, money you may but don't necessarily have because obviously you see them as most important. So your clients will invest in you if they think your service is important and of value to them. Never judge how much they are but if you've been doing this years and clearly you're attracting people who really can't pay and they're, they're always going into bad debt on you and whatever you probably need to look at a different niche of client and you need to increase the value of your service a bit so you just gently detract the kind of clients who want the very low value easy jet kind of service and you and you gently attract the people who want the upper class service so you create more value by the way sometimes the best thing you can do is actually up your price because it attracts a higher uh, clientele if you like so, um, yeah, I hope that helps, um, Stacey. Craig Sharman, with financial education in schools and in life generally being poor, what advice would you give to help the financial education of our children? So this is the third time I've answered this today. So if you listen to the podcast, hopefully you only hear one answer. Otherwise, we haven't edited very well. You're hearing the same question a few times. Um, I would say that you get your kids involved in your life. You get them earning from an early age. You get them associating work, effort and energy with reward, but also smarts and leverage with reward. Um, because, you know, you need to work hard and smart. You know, you use software and systems and people, but you also sometimes have to use sweat equity to, to raise money and make money. So how can I get Bobby earning and going through struggle and challenge to earn money and get rewarded? And how, how can I also reward him when he thinks creatively and has a bit of leverage and maybe is a bit cheeky and a bit bullshit but you know I think oh, no, in the real world the real world's going to reward him and so what I'm trying to do is is you know get him to learn what how to make money and then also penalties um you know if he does something which is a disservice to someone or a, you know or just something which I think the world would you know probably take away from him he needs to learn with and without um I want to get him involved very early in counting and understanding the values of money um, and, you know, like, sorry, the reason I've just kind of paused here is because the, I get the, this question all the time, but it's really generic because it's like if you're a six-year-old kid, which I'm talking about now, my son Bobby, or if you're a 15-year-old kid, it's completely different. It's why this question is so hard to answer. And I always get the, you know, change the financial education of our children. But how old are they? I know some 30-year-olds that don't have as good a financial education as some 10-year-olds. Um, so it definitely depends on their age. And a lot of people are asking me to write a book on this. You know, I might do a, a version money for kids, but kids... Who's kids? What age are kids? You know, you've got to have like naught to three, three to six, six to nine, you know, this sort of this different age group. So, Craig, if you're watching, maybe you could specify a little bit. But I think, I could, um, you know, from an overall, from a wider perspective, for sure, you know, when I was at school, I was a creative and I wanted to do the arty things and I didn't like economics and anything about maths and finance. And some people do, and that's great. But at school, you're not taught about interest rates. You're not taught about assets versus liabilities. You're not taught about... 
um, paying yourself first and never spending more than you earn and having a building up a, a, a pot of savings and then grow to, once you've got enough savings then you can invest once you've got enough investments then you can speculate once you've got enough speculation money you can have a gamble money once you've got gamble money then you can have insurance money to ensure all your wealth you're protected and then how you diversify and the, the the money bucketing and the layers and levels of wealth we weren't taught any of this and by the way that's all in the book money um so yeah you know like I think that it would be, um, I would like to get this out to more people, but I'm not going to get it into the schools. I'm just going to have my own philanthropic cause or venture like I do, which is, um, you know, my brand new foundation that I've set up. So, Mark, would you invest your child's future inheritance perhaps on a medium risk strategy or place safe and let it grow over time on a more safe investment? OK, so what I'd probably do is start by investing it securely and safely, maybe in an ISA. I've opened ISAs for both of my kids. I've got my own ISAs. I always max the ISAs every year. I've been doing for as long as I've been learning how to manage money properly. You know, and that builds up nicely. You've got some ISA millionaires now who started the very, you know, started investing the maximum amount in the first ISAs. Um, so ISAs for me, ISAs for the kids. Get a little, get a, um, a certain, a certain safe pot together. And then what I'll probably do is um, I'll. Um, end up uh, supporting them by helping them earn and save money. So they've got their own money, not just my money, but their own money. Um, so this is a new card that's come out. It's um, for six-year-olds and over. Um, I'll, I'll have to remember the name of it and share it with you. But it's like a bank card for a six-year-old and they can kind of use it. And I've just we've just set one up. I got recommended it um, on an interview I did, actually. Uh, and then I'm also going to look at where they are when they're... 17, 18, you know, if Bobby's world number one golfer, he won't need me. It might be the other way around. Um, but, you know, for example, I remember um, a very wealthy friend of Mark's dad's. Um, he said, look, um, when his son was 18, he said, you're moving out. I'm lending you this deposit for this house. Um, it was a, f a four bedroom, three story townhouse, I think, maybe five bedrooms even. Got five bedrooms out of it. And he said, I'm lending you the deposit, um, but you've got to pay me back. And um, you can do with it what you want, but you, um, I recommend that you rent out all the rooms uh, and you get to keep anything over and above the mortgage. So it's essentially lent him the money to get a house. And so this chap who was, what, in his early 20s, uh, no, no, he was 18, it was uh, when he was 18, he had like five people living in his house taking rent off them um, and making a decent amount of money at that age. That was unheard of. And, but it was more than just the money. It was teaching them how to manage tenants, how to manage money with your friends. And, you know, he probably had some bad experiences with renting to his friends who didn't pay. And, you know, the, the, you've got, I think you've got to give your kids a balanced view of life. People are going to screw you over and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to overpromise. And, you know, then you're, you know, and then you, things are going to go wrong and things are going to go over time and over budget and all these things are going to happen if you, they do. So getting them involved in that and learning the holistic balance to give them that wisdom. I think is very useful for them. Uh, what's the uh, from Sonia? Sonia Mansis Mansisador is what's the best piece of financial advice you ever received? Well, the best financial advice that there is on the planet ever is never spend more than you earn. Duh. Um, but it's true. You know the fundamentals of paying yourself first. Never spending more than you earn. You know, learning how to manage your money so then you can master your money. It might, you know, it might sound so simple, but people are overcomplicating everything. But if every single month from when you started earning money when you were 18 to, you know, however old you are now, you never spent more than you earned and you saved the rest, um, that would compound over time because if you never spent more than you earned, your overheads would go down over time because any loans and debt you had would get paid down. So the differential between what you spend and what you earn would grow. And then as you build a savings pot and then invest it, you get more passive income and it grows and it grows and it will just continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. And even if even if it was only one percent every six months or one percent a year, you know, you went from. 99% spend and of, of what you earn to 98 to 97 to 96 to 95 that will compound and um, you know in 30 or 40 years you're, you might only be spending 50% of what you earn now when I was in debt as an artist I was spending 120% maybe I mean I didn't even work it out but it was definitely more than I was earning because I was getting more in debt every month um, now I spend about 30% of what I earn but I've got kids Mark spends 20% of what he earns, but he hasn't got kids. Kids, private schools, everything. Well, you know, if you're a parent, kids are one of your biggest overheads. Don't pop too many out. All right. Okay. In all, this is from Kevin Benison. In order to maintain and enhance the velocity of money, what percentage of your income do you feel it's reasonable to spend on A, fun and play, and B, giving and donating? So, yeah, I think it's important to, um, I wrote in the book, 
uh, money, about the velocity of money and your personal GDP. There's two big chapters on that. So the velocity of money, i.e. Um, how money moves and the speed of it and the direction of it. And velocity is speed, um, I think speed plus or speed times direction. Um, and then your GDP, which is the amount of money that flows through you. So there's something called the paradox of thrift, which is that, uh, you know, when your personal economy and the world economy is not going so good, the thing that solves the economy is stimulating it to get it to grow again by more spending. But because everyone's scared, they save. And so the paradox is you're more thrifty and you save, but the economy contracts because the, the, it breaks the universal laws of money. Because money doesn't work if everyone hoards it. I mean, imagine if all of us right now just took all of our money and hoarded it and never spent any. The monetary system, money, it just would, it would just like, it, you know, it'd be like all the computers being wiped out. It just would stop. Nothing would happen. And then there'd be looting and violence and everything else. So its nature is to flow. And the more quickly it flows, the more purpose and growth and velocity it has. So it's important to have a personal GDP where money is moving. You know, if you're or if you're always um, hoarding, the world will perceive that you're stingy, uh, you know, and, and maybe overly greedy and you don't share. And therefore it, it will it will restrict the amount that you get. So it's almost like, you know, you have to give to get. And this, I think, is why Kevin's asked about donating to charity and fun and play. Conversely, if you don't manage money wisely and you throw it all away and you show that you're um, flippant with your money and you can't manage it well, the opposite will happen. People won't give you money either because they think, well, they just wasted it and pill for it and they don't know how to manage it. So either extreme will damage your wealth and it won't be in the natural balance of the velocity of money. So fun and play should be enough that um, you're not busting over your spend and you're still saving money and the same with giving and donating. So let's say, for example, I'd say if there are five buckets of money, if you've got your spending, your saving, your investing, your um, you know, bucket list and then your donation money. Um, so spend it, if spending is what, let's call it 70 percent, then you've got 30 percent for the other four. So maybe you have you know, three to five percent for giving and donating. And then you maybe have five to ten percent for fun and play. But, you know, if you're older in life and you don't need much money, and much fun and play and you've got, you know, less than 70 percent um, of your overheads to your income ratio, maybe you could have um, a little bit more giving and donating. You know, so really um, there's the money bu bucketing system in the book and it goes through various different buckets. I'll see if I can get the images up because I drew images of them. Um, but, you know, there's like three or four different um, apportionments of percentages that I suggest. Um, but the reason I suggested a few is because, you know, if you're if you're living on 99 percent spend versus what you earn, then, you know, you've got 0.2 percent left for your other five buckets. And that's what you've got to start with. And then, you, then what you do is get rid of a couple of get direct debits and you get your spending um, you get the it down to 97 percent, then 95 percent, then 93 percent. And then you increase these buckets. Um, all right, Ben Jacob Smith, I'm keen to understand the definition and difference between new money and old money and how the mindsets for the possessors of each differs. What are their goals, patterns and beliefs? Well, you know, new money and old money is just really a very generic phrase. So old money as in inherited money or, you know, third generation wealth or I don't know, maybe monarchy wealth or whatever. You know, look at the Duke of Westminster kind of wealth, the family wealth, the legacy wealth. And then the new money might be like the startup entrepreneurs who've made billions like Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg and, um, you know, um, Jack Ma and all these e-commerce billionaires in China. Um, you know, new, new money sometimes doesn't have the experience and wisdom of generations, so it can make it quickly, but it can lose it quickly. Old money is a little bit more governed by family and policy and history and heritage. Um, I'm definitely more new money because it's only been 10 years, 11 years since I've been making really decent money and I wasn't handed anything from my parents. Um, so, you know, but it's just a phrase, really. I think you can learn from everyone. I like to learn people who, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, if it's third or fourth generation wealth or whatever, the well, you know, like that doesn't really matter. It doesn't really count. They inherited it. But it does count because you can learn from everyone. And imagine if you inherited money from your parents and then from their parents. In some way, yeah, you might be entitled. And in some way, you might not value it quite as much because you didn't earn it. But in the other ways, you might think, this is my family legacy. This is generations of my family. I better not waste this money. And you might end up hoarding it. You might end up spraying it all over the town. 
But managing someone else's money has its different challenges to managing money you've made yourself. Comes with different responsibilities. So, you know, we shouldn't just assume if money is not self-made, it's not real money. It is real money because you've still got a responsibility with it and you can still learn. And you probably learn more about trusts and more about inheritance tax and all that if you've, you know, received second or third generation money, which you haven't learned yet if you're making new money, your own money. Um, so I, I just like to learn from everyone. So I've studied a lot about new money and I've studied a lot about old money. You know, we, when researching um, my book, um, you know, I wanted to know from both sides. I wanted a, a, an equal balance. And, um, and, you know, when I when Bobby gets older, I'll hopefully encourage him and teach him and guide him to be able to make his own money. But, you know, some of mine might go his way. But, you know, it might be in trust or it might be investment only or it might be it might only be reward based. Um, you know, it's famously um, Bill Gates and uh, well, sorry, Warren Buffett, I think, is not really given leaving a, a large amount of his money to his kids. A lot of it's going to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And that's his choice because he maybe sees that. You know, he might not be able to handle the responsibility because you can't, um, money will only exaggerate your traits. So people say, oh, money, it changes people, but it just exaggerates your traits. So whatever you spend and invest and waste right now, if you've got more money, you'd spend, invest and waste in the same way. If you're an addict, then the money's going to fuel the ad addiction. Um, so, you know, sometimes it can be, be a curse, not a gift to give people a load of money. Look at all these lottery winners who end up with nothing two or three years later because you can give someone all the money in the world. But it's education that's the problem. In the schools, the capitalist system, you know, everything. It's not just about a system that's designed for the rich 1% and the poor 99%. It's not designed that way. It wasn't designed, it's evolved. Um, but, you know, some people are saying that that's the way it works. But the reality is the problem isn't de redistribution of wealth, because if you redistribute it, it just goes back to the top again, because the top know how to create it, you know, how to control it, how to create value, how to exchange it, how to produce for the consumers to consume. So the problem to make, you know, the, the, the lower percentiles more wealthy, it's not taking it from the rich, but teaching the poor what the rich know, because, you know, you can accuse the rich of being whatever you want to accuse them of. But most now there's more than 50 percent new money than old money. So now more than half the people who are millionaires and very wealthy in the world are self-made as opposed to inherited. Whereas 20, 30 years ago, it was a much bigger percentage of old inherited money. So the proof is you can start with nothing and you can learn it. And it's the education and the knowledge. And I always go back to that it's knowledge and education. Um, you know, that will make you rich, which is why I spent, oh man, 10, 11 years in the sort of action and the study and the research and the making mistakes and may, may, having some successes in writing this book, Money. So what's the time? It's 25 to 8. So if you have any more questions, I've got a thread running in the progressive community where you can type your questions. You can also post them here below. I'm going to do probably two or three videos a day answering all the questions I get. I'm not jumping in, by the way. I'm just going through them in order. So some of my answers might be good. Some of my answers might be crap. But I haven't. Um, I'm just answering them all fairly and equally as they come in. So if you've got any yourself, I encourage you to ask me because the question you ask could really help you. Uh, and on Thursday, the 19th of October, money is actually live. I'm told it's now in bookstop, bookshops. So people are p posting photos. It's in Waterstones. It's in WH Smiths. So um, if you're watching this before Thursday, the 19th of October, you might want to pop down the shop and beat the rush. But I would rather you and I think you would rather get it on Amazon um, because if you get one copy of money, just tag in your receipt or your screenshot um, below or message me. I'll give you two tickets to our Make, Manage and Master Money event. If you get two copies of money, I will also, in addition to the two tickets, give you a six month online coaching program that I'm running personally every month. It's a group coaching program online. It'll be held on a webinar or Skype call. Um, I'm probably gonna max 200 on that. I'm probably gonna max, we've probably got maybe 75 left of the money event. We filled November. We've got a few places in December and have a new date in January. But if you get five, you get the Make, Manage and Master Money event and you get the online coaching program. And I'll also give you uh, for about 70 of us, 50 to 70. It just depends on how many, um, you know, we, we, we end up fitting in the room between 50 and 70. Uh, mastermind with me, five hours where me and you and a few other people hang out and you can ask me any questions you want about money. I've done a few of these masterminding sessions. They seem to go down really well. We, you know, we, you can ask a lot more personal questions on those than maybe you can in live feeds and group coaching programs. So if you get one, two or five copies of money and put your receipt or your screenshot below or private message me, I'm getting a lot of private messages at the moment, so bear with me um, if I don't get back to you straight away. 
uh, then hey, and I'm, we, I'm making this offer live until the end of Thursday the 19th of October. So at midnight on Thursday the 19th stroke, Friday the 20th, all this offer ends. I know some of you would have seen this a couple of times. You're still sitting on the fence. I don't know if you're waiting for a better offer. There is no better offer. This is an amazing offer. Um, but once the book is launched on the day, that's it. Um, but, you know, the events may fill up soon. I don't even know how many we've got booked on if I'm, you know, up front with you, which I always am. Uh, I'll find that out and, um, and then I'll just turn the threads off. So, yeah, go grab your copies right now on Amazon. Um, Sean has said, does the audiobook count for the deal? It doesn't, I'm afraid, because I did a different deal for the audiobook. Um, you know, some people say, well, why would I give all these great bonuses away? Um, and that's because you help me with the book rankings. And then when the book rankings are high, so many people share it and I reach more people than I wouldn't if, I, the, the, if the book wasn't higher. So, you know, you help me and I help you. Um, but if you've already got the audio book, you'll need to go and get the paperback as well because it's a different offer. But thanks very much. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, and remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.